So our first speaker is uh, Eva Le Chabard from uh, University Paris 1 uh, in France, and she will speak about metastability for interacting neurons. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Romain. I will try to, to put this on full screen. Okay, so now you should have a nice look at it. So thank you for inviting me. So I'm, I'm working in Paris 1 in, in Sorbonne Uni. University, and this is a joint work with um, Pierre Montmarchi, who is a probabilist from uh, Paris on the former Paris 6. And uh, okay, so I start right away. So I will speak about metastability for interacting neurons uh, in, in a mean field frame. Um, uh, so I start with the uh, N spiking neurons who are described by the membrane potential values, which are positive. So it's a complete uh, excitatory uh, framework. So I call the potentials XTN1 up to XTNN. And then each neuron spikes at a rate. So there is a jump process behind, uh, which is F of its potential at a given time. And the rate function F is increasing. It's supposed to be Lipschitz, it will be bounded. And, uh, and this is important, uh, f of zero is zero such that if there is no input, there will be no spiking. I will explain that more. And then when one of the neuron spikes, its own potential is reset to, to resting value. And for convenience, I choose that to be equal to zero. And all the other neurons in the systems, and that's the mean field assumption, get the same additional positive kick to their potential, which is H divided by capital N, so capital N is the size of the system, okay? And in the SQL, I will call this little parameter H. It will uh, have a certain role. I will call that the synaptic rate. So that doesn't evolve in time. So little H is fixed all over this, um, this talk. So this is the spiking mechanism. So basically you have to think of, I mean, it's really spiking neurons and in between successive spikes, we have a leakage effect and I take that to be uh, at, at exponential speed. So uh, the potential of the neurons are lost at weight minus alpha times xt in, the, the, in between the successive uh, jumps of the system. So this is a model that I have first uh, and, uh, seen in, in papers by Bruno Cessac in uh, discrete time. And then we started working about that together with Antonio Galvez and uh, started also writing down the mean field limits in a series of papers. The first one with um, Anna De Masi, Antonio, myself, Enrico Prezut in 2015. Then there was a follow-up paper by uh, Nicolas Fournier. There is a, a paper by uh, Philippe Robert and Jonathan Tubul. And Quentin will speak about that in the next talk also. Okay, so it's a simple leaky integrate and fire model. And um, just for those of you who come from the Markov uh, process world, so it's actually a very simple Markov process. It's in dimension N, and it's what people call a piecewise deterministic uh, Markov process. That means the only stochasticity comes through the jumps, the spikes, and in between successive jumps, there is nothing but, a, but the deterministic flow, which is describing the leakage of, of each uh, neuron's potential. So the generator is this one, is the sum of two terms. The second term is the, the deterministic flow, the loss of potential. And the first one tells you that actually given the potential values of the neurons, they all um, spike independently, the one of the other. So the underlying Poisson noise is actually independent for each of the neurons. And then it describes uh, explicitly the jumps of the total system. So the jumps are described by this delta i here. And it's um, small jumps for all of the neurons who receive the uh, synaptic kick of the spiking one, so the H divided by capital N. But there is the reset of the spiking neuron to zero. Uh, and that's why there is a minus Xi here. And we call that, you will see that in the last talk of this session by Xaviani, we call that the big jumps, which are unbounded, and which are actually the reason why even in the mean field limit, um, the model will stay. Uh, stochastic. So for those of you who like Hawks processes, just to tell you that this process can be seen as a Hawks process in dimension N. So it's a system of interacting Hawks processes, which are nonlinear because of the weight function F. 
and uh, which would have exponential kernel function and the reset to zero, which is uh, an additional feature. Okay. So the system itself for n neurons, since I suppose that f of zero is equal to zero and zero was uh, the reset value just after the spike, this induces actually the fact that the all zero state is the only invariant state of the finite uh, neuron system. And actually this has been shown first in the paper by Alini Duarte and Guillaume Ost. So if the spiking rate function is only differentiable in zero, that's the only thing you need to know, uh, plus this Lipschitz continuity, then we know that almost surely the system will stop spiking after a finite time. And which means that after the last spike of the total system, it will just relax back to, to, to equilibrium, which is zero here, okay? And the proof of that is actually very easy, but I skip it. Uh, and of course, this is only true for fixed finite size systems. So as n tends to infinity, that will drastically change. And this is what my talk is about. So actually as n tends to infinity, so in infinite uh, limit systems, the zero um, configuration will become unstable, at least if we take good values of the set of parameters. And the parameters are the loss of the potential and the um, input synaptic rate little h the kick that you give to the others. Okay, I don't see the first line because there's the zoom, which is hiding that away. But so I just told you that there is a last spiking time, which is finite uh, for the system after which there is no spike anymore in the system. And this is of course kind of um, natural because you might have observed that I'm speaking about isolated systems. So there is no outside input of the outside world. So it's an isolated system of neurons. So you can interpret L, this last spiking time, as the time an initial stimulus uh, would survive in the system until it, its influence just uh, fades away. Okay, and this is a simulation that uh, Christophe Poussard made in a slightly different version of the same system where we added uh, synaptic plasticity. And I just put that here to convince you that actually for big N, so the, the membrane potential is here, time is going on here. This is the residual calcium, whatever. You see that it's attracted to something which is not zero clearly. So that would be something that we call the metastable state of the system. And I will explain that in the, in the sequel of the talk. So this will be the main part of the talk. So I speak about metastability. Okay, so I try to explain that this state of the state space where somehow the system seems to stabilize is a metastable state of the system and what that actually means. So if you open mathematical papers on metastability, you will see definitions like these ones. It's a transient behavior of the system. So it's something that will not persist in the very long run, but it's a, it's a behavior where the system stays a long time close to something that is seemingly a stable point and that we call the metastable state. And it has been first um, made rigorous by uh, Leibovitz and Penrose in the Journal of Statist Statistical Physics paper in 1971 uh, by these three points. So the first point, if, if you have a system and a metastable state and you start in the metastable state or close to it, then you're very likely to stay very long in the vicinity of this state. But once you have been kicked out of it, it's also very unlikely to return there, okay? And this kick out, so the, the exit time of the, of the neighborhood of the metastable state uh, is actually usually unpredictable. And for probabilists, this means that, that it must be exponentially distributed, okay? If we suitably renormalize this time. So that's what I'm going to show in the framework of, of the neurons here. Uh, you might have seen talks about metastability for small noise diffusions that evolve in an energy landscape like that. So I tried to make a picture here. So this is the energy where the diffusion lives. So you have the minimum of the energy here. So that would be a stable state. 
And the second local minimum here is a metastable state. And to come from the metastable state to the stable one, you have to cross this energy barrier. And the higher this barrier, the, the, the more difficult it is. So this is actually, it's linked, of course, to large deviation theory. And it's the appearance of a statistically rare event, even so this uh, overcrossing of the, the barrier that pushes the system out of the metastable state into the stable one, if there is a stable one. Okay. So of course, for the, for the neurons here, I don't have an explicit shape of an energy, but I, I will show something similar in, in the framework of the neurons. Okay, so what I'm going to, to show is that actually the renormalized last spiking time, so L divided by its expectation, asymptotically, so as n tends to infinity, will converge to an exponential distribution. And intuitively, this will happen because during a long time, the system has the impression that it's already in its infinite population limit. And inside this infinite population limit, also close to another invariant state than the zero one. Okay. Uh, and usually, this uh, metastability is shown for stopping times. So stopping time would mean that the event of having observed the last spiking time before time t, that should be something that only depends on the past before time t. But of course, at time t, you don't know if the last spiking time has already happened or not. So it's not a stopping time. We could turn it into a stopping time by considering a slightly bigger filtration. But I'm not going to do that in the sequel. Actually, I will prove metastability for a certain exit time of interesting domains. And these domains will be the first one that the average weight of the system, of the total system, is above a certain threshold, which, which I call delta. So delta is something positive. And the second type of domains is to, so, to say that the average spiking weight is in the vicinity of the limit n to infinity limit equilibrium spiking weight. Okay. So these two kinds of state spaces, domains of the state space will be considered. And for the exit times of them, I will prove that it's exponential. So depending on the time that remains, I will try to explain you three things, at least some ideas behind them. So the first is what the limit systems looks like. The second, what the invariant states of the limit look like, and then why there will be this exponential distribution. And the main mathematical arguments of, my, of our approach will be coupling. Uh, I will explain that. And the construction of a simple auxiliary process that will give us a lower bound on the total spiking weight of the finite system. And that is easy to, um, to be studied from the large deviation uh, point of view. I will just give some hints on all these um, ideas in the, in the sequence. So first of all, the limit system, and that also, I guess, uh, prepares the talk by uh, Quentin. In the limit, as I told you, the, the big jumps will survive because each neuron, even in the infinite population limit, will uh, continue uh, spiking uh, stochastically according to its own weight. So in the limit, each neuron will be described by a differential equation, which is nonlinear, which describes its, um, the evolution of its potential. So we still have the loss. We still have the reset to zero after the spiking. And then the influence of the system due to the spikes of the other neurons just becomes deterministic as it's usually in the mean field uh, limit. So it will be H times the average spiking weight of the system at the given time. Okay. So this is a nonlinear system because it depends on the expectation of, of the spiking weight. But uh, you can show that actually this, this is well defined under appropriate uh, conditions on the spiking weight. And actually, we even have a control on the difference of the limit potential and the finite size potential of a given neuron if we construct them jointly using the same noise. And uh, this uh, control is given over finite time intervals. And then the speed of convergence is in one over square root of n. And this has already been done in, in the paper by uh, Robert Toubul, in the paper by uh, Nicolas, myself. I guess it's also in the papers by uh, Quentin that he will speak about them. I will cite them a little bit later. Okay. OK, 
Okay, so this is the limit system. Good. So what about invariant states of the limit system? So whenever you are in an invariant state, that means that it must be stationary. And that means that the average uh, input that comes from the system, so the h times uh, the mean spiking rate must be constant. So I call that constant just a little b. You consider this as a parameter. And then for each fixed point of the parameter, you just get a classical renewal Markov process. Why renewal? Because you have the spiking urn the reset to zero and each reset to zero induces a loss of memory property because, uh, and then you can write down actually explicitly the, the associated invariant probability measure. For each parameter B, you get exactly one probability measure, pi B, and then you have to solve the self-consistency equation, which just tells you that for the nonlinear equation, the unique or, or the relation must be that H times P of F, so the mean spiking rate under the parameter B must equal the parameter. Okay, I guess Quentin will speak about that more. So of course, if we take the parameter B to be equal to zero, that just means the all zero system is still an invariant state. Of course, that must be like that. And then the main question is, will be there another invariant state? And the answer is yes, if the synaptic rate is sufficiently high. So, um, well, it's not exactly only the synaptic rate, which is important. It's actually the product of the synaptic rate and the derivative of the weight function in zero, which means that you have a product of what I would call the sensitivity. So this is this uh, third parameter K, which is the derivative of the, the weight function in zero. Okay, so if the product of sensitivity times synaptic weight is sufficiently big, so bigger than the loss weight, then it's possible to prove it's relatively easy that we must have at least a second uh, non-trivial invariant state for the limit system. And this has, has been by, observed by all these people. And actually the, the second equilibrium is an absolute continuous measure having a, a compact state space. You can write it down explicitly, except that you don't know the, uh, the closed formula for the mean spiking rate. Okay. Well, and for the sequel, actually, for the coupling and this loss of memory, actually, we did it in the framework where the spiking rate f. You remember, I told you it must be bounded, and actually, we did it in the in the case where it's linear and then set weights. Okay. Which is, of course, a very big uh, uh, well simplification. We are confident that it would also work for something convex and then saturation, but the saturation is really important. I hope that I have time to explain that. So let's, uh, let us stick to this. So I have weight, so increase of weight K up to the, to the moment when I cross the saturation level, which is this little F star here, which is the maximum, okay? And this, in the sequel of the talk, I will only speak about that. Um, and then we can show in this framework if, if k times h is sufficiently high, then actually the second equilibrium in the limit system is unique and it's globally attracting at exponential speed. Uh, there is this series of papers by Etienne, Quentin, and Gaumont on the long time behavior of the limit system. I'm not going to speak about that. I will speak about something else, which is a, a loss of memory property that induces uh, uh, the exponentiality and uh, which is done by coupling. And this coupling will actually imply our main result, which tells us that for these saturating weight functions and for sufficiently high values of K times H, so the increase rate of the, the function F and the synaptic weight, uh, we have the following, uh, that the finite system, so for n finite, stays a long time in the vicinity of the limit. What do I mean by limit? I mean actually the limit equilibrium spiking rate that I don't know explicitly, but I know it exists. And then the exit time of this vicinity, which I call little tau here, is exponentially distributed in this sense here, okay? So the probability uniformly in little t, the probability of overshooting t, if you renormalize by the expectation, that will tend to e to the minus t, which is the 
the corresponding quantity for the exponential function. And we have also an explicit uh, speed of convergence in the system. Okay. So why the exponential distribution? So actually what, what we did in our, in our paper is the following, we cut the state space into two parts. So the main part is there where the mean spiking rate, which I call F bar, so it's just the sum over all spiking weights divided by N, is strictly about some small threshold. And then the idea is if the process, the N particle process has not left this space here after some fixed time, which doesn't depend on N, on, it's, it's a fixed time, say one, then this mean spiking rate must be in a vicinity of the limit equilibrium. And once you are in this vicinity, I will be able to construct the coupling and uh, forget the initial position which induces uh, the loss of memory. So the trials to reach the all zero configuration become independent. And this gives you something like a geometric distribution that converges to an exponential one. Okay. Um, actually, I'm not completely honest here because it's not a vicinity of the true limit equilibrium, it's the vicinity of an auxiliary limit equilibrium that we constructed by this auxiliary process. Um, I try to explain you this here. So actually, all we did is based on the idea to, to compare the mean spiking rate of the system to an auxiliary jump process, also a PDP, PDMP, for which we know the exact large deviation um, estimate. And this uh, jump process, I can show you the generator, please don't look at it, but <laughs> all I wanted to say is that uh, here, the jump terms, which is the blue one, is only of the order one over N, so it only has small jumps. So by considering only the, the mean spiking weight and the lower bound on it, we can manage to consider classical uh, large deviation, I mean, classical jump processes for which we know the, the limit process and for which we have an explicit limit system, which is a deterministic one and not stochastic, okay? And for this deterministic limit system, which gives us a lower bound on the mean spiking weight, we know that there, there will be a second invariant measure that is attracting and we will use this attractiveness to couple processes in the limit. I guess I don't have time to speak about coupling. So I just will close with this, uh, with this um, figure here. Uh, so this reproduce is basically what I told you before. So I have a big part of the state space and basically the process will spend all of its time in this big part. This is the D here where the mean spiking rate is lower than by something very small. If we start in this big part of the process of the state space, then after some finite time, I will enter this small one, the wet one, where the mean spiking rate is above the, the limit weight of the auxiliary process, which is a very pessimistic lower bound, but that helps me to couple processes, which means that inside this part of the state space, if I take two trajectories, then I will able to couple them in a time which is of order n and coupling means that I really force them to evolve together. And this induces actually the loss of memory that gives the exponential distribution. Okay, so I will stop here. I will just make a last slide. So my phone tells me it's 50, uh, 25, so I have to stop. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to mention that this is not the first time, of course, that metastability for systems of interacting neurons has been um, considered. There are other papers by Morgan André. He will speak on Wednesday or Thursday, I, I guess, in the, in the ses session of um, Christophe Pouza. And there is a um, uh, numerical study by Mila Brokini and Miguel Abadich in the time discrete version. Okay. And our paper with Apia is on archive and it has also appeared. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eva. Um, do we have, uh, so if you have any question, you can raise your hand. Uh, there's a little button at the bottom of the screen. And uh, then I will uh, invite you to speak to Eva.
I was too fast. So I'm not very familiar with this process. So if I miss some of you. Uh... Um, Rainer? Uh, excuse me. Is, is it possible that there is a, a kind of parallel situations in classical branching processes where you know when the branching process is critical, then well, uh, if he's still alive after a long time, then you will, will be in exponential, uh, you will be close to an exponential limit distribution. And uh, is this a kind of, uh, of parallel, parallel phenomenon or is this completely false? So the, no, I'm, I'm, pretty like sure this. I'm pretty sure it's, it's exactly the same, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of the theory on branching processes, but I guess it's also linked to a quasi stationary uh, distributions. But of course, so if, if you have a critical or even subcritical, uh, no critical or yeah. mm -hmm. say critical branching process, which has not yet died out, yeah. then you're then you're sure that you're close to something that that looks like a, a stable. Yes, if you yeah. normalize as you yeah, I it think is, it's uh, okay. Thank you. But maybe I should add because you have mentioned the name critical. No, uh, yeah. I, I guess that all we showed here would be in, of course, there is no direct comparison to a branching process here, but it, it's if I could compare then I would say it's the supercritical uh, regime that we have been working in. Uh -huh. um, because I'm not, I'm not quite sure that it's really the same framework because the second- no, it's, it's, it's uh, 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 certainly not the same framework, but uh, there seem to be some parallelity in terms of metastability. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, there seems to be a question by uh, Etienne. Can you speak? Oops, oops. Okay, thank you, Eva. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, can you tell us a little more about your assumption that the rate is uh, globally Lipschitz? So what happens if you, you take say f of x equal to x square and you, you, you don't choose any cutoff? Uh, as you know, the limit, the, the mean field limit exists and can be proven to be, I mean, all this works perfectly fine. So you want to take X squared and um, and cut it off at some, we, we need we need that it's uh, something like concave, Etienne. It's, it's because all I told you and I even did not really tell you about that. We, we did the coupling of the weights and we have to be able to deduce the coupling of the associated processes from the coupling of the weights. And we are able to do that only for concave weight functions. So X squared for our result, I'm not sure I would be able to say something for the moment with the same techniques. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we will stop question. Uh...